Word is, man's best friend started out as one of these. And then Homo sapiens, us, got involved and applied our innovation and creativity to create the dog. <laughs> All right. So, you ever look what we look, look what we did? The variety uh, of uh, dogs that are out there. Do you ever you ever hear somebody look at one of these and say, "That's not a real dog"? Huh? I, I have. I've used that phrase. You might be wondering what dogs have to do with medical technology innovation. As it turns out, quite a bit. So, what is medical technology innovation? To demystify that term a bit, let's put it in historical context. For most of the history of hominins, or human-like primates, there were multiple species. So we've all seen some version of this drawing. But it didn't happen like this. Evidence would suggest it happened more like this. We come from a multi-species world, full of close cousins. For example, Neanderthals and sapiens coexisted for a period of time. These different hominins evolved by their genes and their external environment, a mechanism that came to be known as Darwinism. Survival of the fittest in the short term, survival of the most adaptable in the long term. Sapiens won that game. Congratulations to us. <laughs> right? So with sapiens firmly on top, medical technology innovation got its start. Sapiens figured out, starting with some simple herbs, that they could add med tech to the mix of genes and environment to create advantage, to heal us when we were sick, to fix us when we were broken, and over time, to help us live longer, better, higher quality lives. That's essentially medical technology innovation in a nutshell from prehistory all the way through the 20th century. But recently, something really fundamental has changed. Darwinism is dead for sapiens. We not only won that game, we ended that game for our species. So, medical technology going forward has enabled the tools for us, for the first time, to give the species a power to influence the direction of its own evolution. So the future of medical technology innovation is going to be less about innovating things that help us live longer, better lives, and it's going to be more about innovating ourselves. Welcome to self-directed evolution. Now, is that really possible? Yes, it is starting to happen now. So how much of me can I replace or modify or change out before I'm not one of us anymore? Not a real person. 3D printed organs? Maybe some robotic components that respond to my thoughts. Maybe a memory card upgrade for my brain. Okay, the last one is still a stretch, but the first two are actually already here. And everyone knows our genes influence us profoundly, right? But they're not the whole story by a long shot. Picture your genome as a piano and my genome as a guitar, and somebody plays happy birthday on both instruments. We would recognize the song in both cases. We would also recognize they're being played on different instruments, different genomes. Now picture someone sitting at that same piano, playing Happy Birthday, and then changing the sheet music to play a Mozart symphony. Same instrument, same genome, very different results. That analogy illustrates something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the sheet music that gets played on your genetic piano. Epigenetics regulates your genes. It turns them on and off. It turns the amount of protein they make up or down. It influences how those proteins get modified. So for example, if you could wake up the right dormant genes on me, maybe I could grow back our long lost tail. 
Would that make me less of a real person? But let's not stop at turning our genes on and off or up and down. Why settle for swapping out the sheet music when I can turn my piano into a guitar? Many of you have probably heard of gene editing or genetic engineering, the process of deliberately making changes to our genes. Historically, that has been a pretty dicey proposal. It took highly sophisticated, expensive equipment, highly trained personnel, and even then, it was a roll of the dice. Very, very difficult to do precisely and to assure good outcomes. But lately, a new tool called CRISPR has arrived. CRISPR has made gene editing so easy and so precise that with some high-end equipment, you could practically do it in your kitchen. And this is not some Orwellian future threat. CRISPR-edited babies have already been created and born. And the tools just keep getting better and easier. So how far do we go with these tools until the result isn't a real person anymore? And I'm only talking about the changes that get done on purpose. What about the mistakes? Or as CRISPR users euphemistically call them, the off-target effects? Now, the fact that these tools are already in use shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. One thing we know about sapiens is if we can do something, we tend to do it. And we'll deal with the consequences later. So how's all this going to turn out? Yeah. Maybe you should ask your dog. Darwinism ended for them the day we took control of their breeding. And we've demonstrated our ability to get pretty creative with a complex mammal using only the tool, crude tool, of selective breeding. With the massively more powerful tools of medical technology at our disposal, make no mistake about it, Sapiens is rapidly approaching a major fork in its evolutionary road. That makes this possibly one of the most exciting or scariest times in human history. To determine how to use the tools of self-directed evolution in a way that benefits, think of the possibilities with these tools. No more cancer. No more Alzheimer's. No more diabetes. And as long as we're getting rid of diabetes, let's wipe out obesity. But is being fat a defect that needs to be cured? Ah, well, for sure, let's get rid of addiction. And if along the way there's an off-target effect that maybe makes us more accepting of authority or more compliant, eh, there's a price to be paid for everything. And let's get rid of arthritis, please. And as long as we're getting rid of arthritis, let's throw in some extra speed, a little extra strength. But how much? Let's add some extra years. But how many? And if we're adding years, we're going to increase population. We should stop making tall people. They're resource hogs. They eat more food. They drive bigger cars. They need bigger houses. It would be for the greater good, right? Welcome to the slippery slope, folks. And don't be fooled if this ethical and moral slope seems shallow at first. Take a few steps on the surface of self-directed evolution, and the steep drop-off will take your breath away. Master race of blue-eyed blondes, anyone? So how will we know when we've gone too far? Will we just know it when we see it? Sure, it seems easy when I show you pictures of these guys, right? It seems very obvious and very far in the future. But it might be coming faster than you might think or want. Some of you might remember from the 2012 Olympics, this guy, Oscar Pistorius. A huge controversy raised at the time as to whether he should be allowed to participate in the games because of the unfair advantage his high-tech legs gave him. Well, with this next wave of modifications and improvements coming, where will the next shoe drop? Will it be college or pro sports? Maybe it'll be questions I'm allowed to ask in a job interview or in an insurance application. And how will finances figure into all this? 
If only the very wealthy can afford a procedure like splicing in a few extra IQ points, the gap we have today between haves and have-nots will seem like child's play in a generation or two. As our dogs so aptly demonstrate, you underestimate sapiens' capacity for creativity and for mischief at your own hazard. To decide how to use the tools of self-directed evolution equitably and fairly. To decide whether we stay together as a single species or return to a multi-hominin world. To answer questions like this well will require a level of civic engagement previously reserved for world wars. The alternative is it might cause wars, but this time it'll be the modified versus the unmodified. I don't want that. I want a world where all of humanity evolves its way to lives worthy of celebration, where we collectively become humans 2.0. I don't want to live in H.G. Wells' world of Morlocks and Eloy. So we're the first species on this planet with both the privilege and the burden of having the opportunity to influence our own evolution. What are we, what are you, going to do with that? Are we going to allow the developers, the practitioners, the regulators of medical technology to determine our future as a species? Guys in white lab coats have done some really horrible things over the years. And while the science is not going to slow down, we have some time. And so you are now called to use that time to get educated so that you can make responsible, informed choices. What will your role be in all of this? Active or passive? Spectator or participant? because this train is leaving the station. You can decide to get on board. You can decide to watch it go. You might try to stop it or change its destination. But be prepared to make wise decisions. We all want to leave a better world for our great-grandchildren. But now we must consider what our great-grandchildren will be. Thanks. Thank you.